A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 20 Family Life On Saturdays about five o'clock the full-time football results would be broadcast straight after the news the sing-song voice of the announcer enunciating the score in such a way that the listener could guess the final result would relay the information for the populace as a whole to take down the results that they could find out if they had won the football pools and mark up their coupon lc would generally do the marking up giving one point for a home win two for an, for an away and three for a draw counting the completed coupon for each line's result and how excited they all were as the scores mounted then all the lines had to be totaled up the family would gather round to hear the results there were occasions when they came very close to a winning score how elsie would have wished to have been able to return to tatworth and buy her own home however it wasn't to be and it remained a longed-for hope once a month Bert would go to Mac Fisheries fish shop to buy a pint of winkles, a small edible sea snail. Elsie would butter some bread and he would bend some pins to winkle out the snail. They were lovely and the family considered them a treat. At the weekends one of Albert's jobs on Saturday afternoons was to saw up and chop sufficient wood for the, for the, for a week for the fire, both logs and kindling. This was necessary for both the kitchen and the sitting-room fire. Large planks and bolts of wood were sawn into logs using the family saw. This Bert sharpened by bending every alternate tooth of the saw and then turning the saw over, repeating the process on the other side. If extra sharpening necessary, he would file the teeth, rubbing oil into the blade to ease its passage through the wood and prevent the blade from rusting. To save completely sawing the wood through, the log would be smashed to the ground to break off the last inch or so. He would then chop the wood into pieces for both lighting the fire and to produce smaller logs. If the axe or chopper proved difficult to cleave, then a hammer was used to force it through the wood. The whole operation lasted a back-breaking hour, and as with all jobs Bert tackled, his aim was to complete the job as quickly as possible with sleeves rolled up and a wooden horse set into position to hold the post or plank work would begin sawing at, at a fast pace it was terry's job to hold the wood to prevent it from slipping stan chopped the logs on a large block of wood behind the net curtain elsie anxiously watched her menfolk getting on with the job when it came to, mu uh, mu um, to Bert's turn to chop the wood, his arm action was a blur as sticks flew into the pile awaiting collection for later stacking in the coal shed. The back door off the kitchen led out onto the backyard and garden. It was built into the centre of the rear kitchen wall on one side of a, sm a, a small window dutifully clothed in its regulation net curtain under which resided an ancient gas stove with polished brass taps. On the other side of the door the butler sink with traditional wooden drainer above which a range of shelves contained toothbrushes and powder you can imagine the whole family using the same tin of tooth powder. A whole range of never-to-be-disturbed cleaning fluids and mugs, their own layer of clinging dust and debris added to over the years, and underneath hung on cup hooks the flannel and dishcloth, scourer and bottle brush, ever in the way, swaying and dripping, occasionally dropping into the waiting bowl as you enter the kitchen by the hill door there on your left was a welsh dresser and a narrow fitting broom cupboard this completed the back kitchen wall two glazed doors made up the whole wall, top section of the dresser with glass covered by a decorative film these hid shelves containing the tea and dinner service the cups hung on cupboards on cup hooks, held back by an assortment of letters and envelopes addressed to someone long forgotten, with curling corners and faded script. An assortment of odd cups, jugs and pops filled the spaces. The final shelf was devoted to the family's medicines. 
Beecham's pills, Carter's little liver pills, aspirin, Friar's balsam, calamine lotion, corn plasters, band-aids, smelling sorts, camphorated oil, cough mixtures, Vaseline, boracic powder, iodine, bandages and slings, syrup of figs for tummy upsets, castor oil, centipods and camphorated oil, Epsom salts, various syringes and an assortment of safety pins. Built into the bottom section was a large cupboard which housed the children's toys and woe betide anyone who was stupid enough to open this for the, if they did a whole stream of toys, wooden bricks and books would come tumbling out. On wet days Elsie would give her boys the job of tidying the cupboard which of course never achieved, was never achieved as they played with each new discovery and screwed into the side of the dresser next to the door was Albert's pipe rack, holding at least six pipes, an assortment of spills and reamers beneath which perched an overflowing letter rack. On the far side opposite the door the broom cupboard gave space to the mop, broom, dustpan and brush, dusters, candles, oil lamps, kindling for the fire, shoe cleaning equipment, cod liver oil and malt, and all the family's everyday shoes. During the war, Albert's rifle were, was propped up against the corner next to his chair whilst he polished his uniform. The gas pipes ran up the wall to the meter and perched on top of the broom cupboard nestling next to the meter a torch and a looped earth wire for the radio. The radio relayed the fateful message that September. The concentrated silence as the whole house was stilled listened to the Prime Minister. Terry's life remained unaltered. He saw and felt no change whatever. It was not until that September that the air raids, the searchlights and anti-aircraft guns began to focus attention on what was really happening. It was the London Blitz. After Hitler switched his war forces from levering Britain's airfields and radar chain that made the first big impact on the family's life then they could see and feel the difference. It took the victory at El Alamein and Stalingrad to mark a turning point, which led to ultimate victory. Still, that was in the future. In the meantime, Terry attended Longfield Infant School. Every day he marked the map, printed in the national newspapers, as the nation's troops advanced, dropped back, before advancing again. All householders had to fill in a census form on the 29th of September 1939, detailing who lived in his or her house. This information enabled the government to issue identity cards, a national registration number and a ration book set by post to each, po each person. The whole nation was informed by radio, newspapers and notices displayed by poster in all local shops. The information directed how the system operated, how to register at local shops and how the hot shopkeeper was to cut out the coupon keeping the counterfoils. It further detailed how to fill in the ration book, name, address on each page and told how the counterfoil was to be used. The counterfoil needed the date, the shop's name and address. The shop was initially elected as shop of choice and retained for a period of six months. Elsie had to queue as soon as the shops opened. There was often a mad scramble to make for the counter bearing what currently was in short supply. There was nothing slapdash about the ration book system. Elsie never lost any of the books throughout the war and afterwards. She took a great deal of trouble to ensure the family received the best food that was available, supplementing what she could by what came out of the garden and hen house. Any visitor to the house recognised the importance of the rifle, propped up in the corner. Albert was always dressed in army uniform and carried a baton. He assumed his rank and office without fuss, emitting confidence and authority. His frequent trips away was a trial to Elsie. The installation of the telephone marked a change in routine for my for 
It, it was essential that he kept in daily touch with his headquarters. Whenever he left the house, he took with him his service revolver and rifle. However, the family was not unduly affected. Home life continued, governed by Elsie's preferences and capabilities, based upon her past rural habits and upbringing. Between the broom cupboard and the sink dresser was the black kitchen range built into the wall. All, all the cast iron pipework ran along the kitchen wall, from the kitchen range to the sink, up the wall, through the ceiling to the bathroom, the hot water to the hot water tank in the airing cupboard and the cold mains to the cold water tank housed in the loft. The kitchen rain was patented as multi-purpose, with a blackened eye was a blackened iron monstrosity which contained the back boiler and bread oven. The bread oven, its doors opened downwards to form a shelf, was never used for its designed purpose but to dry kindling. The family lived in perpetual fear that the whole lot would catch fire, which it frequently did. Above the kitchen range was a mantel shelf always crammed with biscuit tin, fire lighting spills, clock, candle holder, small box with drawers, letter bills, postcards and the day's pipe tobacco pouch and Elsie's cigarettes. Strung under the mantelpiece a washing line where the current tea towel dried and above the shelf a mirror hanging from string attached to a very prominent nail. Stuck into the wood frame postcards long forgotten, yellow with age and curled. In front of the fire surrounded the hearth, a copper sheathed fender was linked by two upholstered, upholstered coal boxes, one on either side. An imposing brass railed fire guard kept the flying cinders from scorching the hearth rug. This served as a clothes horse often draped with the laces washed garment, usually Elsie's apron. When young, the boys bathed in front of the fire in a tin bath that hung outside the back door, the towels stretched out warming on the guard ready to dry as they stepped out onto the hearth rug. The bath was too heavy for Elsie to lift so the water had to be bailed out first into the sink. Mondays were always washing day. The clothes placed in a large galvanized iron washing tub over the gas burner. A convex bottom plate kept the washing off the bottom from burning. The washing crystals and paired soap block, the wore and the washed clothes, then were taken out of the boiler and ferried dripping to the sink to be rinsed a rickets blue bag used in the rinsing water for all the whites whilst collars and cuffs treated with robin starch. Once rinsed, the clothes were taken out to the backyard to be mangled and then hung to dry. The mangle, as all mechanical apparatus in the house, was never bought new and had seen better days. In fact, it was ancient heavy and massive, survived long enough to see its torturers marred with married with children of their own. The mangle gave in to science, superseded by a twin tub, ending its working life thirty years later. Now the mangle would be regarded as an of ancient lineage and worth a king's ransom, but then it lurked next to the coal shed with a sack for a cover ever capable of extracting more water than the 1500 revolution per minute washer. To extract the maximum amount of water, the tension roller springs were over-tightened by screwing down the tap light screws at the top of the mangle. This ensured that to turn the handle, the handle needed the strength of ten men. The machine would creak and groan to spew out its charge flat as a board, sometimes with all the buttons split. The wrung-out clothes were shaken out and hung on crossed wires stretching across the backyard. If it rained, they were hung on the air in the kitchen or placed on the clothes horse in front of the fire. Ironing day, ironing day was Tuesday, using flat irons heated on the gas stove. 
Elsie spat on the heated iron to see if it was hot enough. The ironing was done on a blanket laid on the kitchen table. Bert's shirts with their detachable collars and cuffs pressed and, st and polished using an iron. His trousers were pressed using an old tea towel to stop polishing the nap of the cloth using soap from a thin bar run down the inside creases then the hole ironed on the outside to give them extra sharpness. He always wore pinstripe trousers, black jacket and waistcoat, watch chain, black great coat and highly polished shoes topped off with a bowler hat and always carried a pair of leather gloves, briefcase and furled umbrella during the day and at night a silver topped walking cane. Elsie cleaned and tidied the house but not to the extent that she could be accused of being house proud. Life proceeded in an orderly manner with the rules laid down by Albert. Meals were at set times, the weekly routine never altered, made for continuity. There was little formality except when an aunt came for tea and the front room was used. The few visitors who did visit came to see Elsie during the day and then only for a cup of tea in the kitchen. Albert and Elsie were never the one to dust or clean. The vacuum cleaner didn't work and there were no feather dusters. Damp tea leaves were sat scattered over the carpet to be swept up using a dustpan and brush. The damp leaves attracted the dirt and the collection achieved without causing more dust. This old Victorian habit took the place of sawdust. If there was any hard or dirty work like cleaning the gas stove, heavy gardening, hedge clipping, beating the rugs, blacking the stove, fetching the coal or cutting the wood, cleaning the shoes, decorating and cleaning, all the brass work then Albert turned to. Elsie's tasks were to make the beds, see to the washing, ironing and cooking, and to shop. Windows were attended by the window cleaner, the only outside labour engaged. The carpets were mostly hand swept, the stairs with a dustpan and brush. The spring clean was an annual event and taken as an opportunity to, to, to apply whitewash and distemper to the walls and ceilings. Nothing was ever wasted, worn clothes altered, patched or darned. Faded clothes dyed, frayed collars turned, worn sheet top and tailed. Towels became flannels and flannels became dishcloths, and dishcloths consigned to the shed. Orange boxes became bedside cupboards, bricks used to take up room in the fire to save coal, and buttons saved, laced hoarded, and wood stored. The basic kitchen furniture consisted of an old, dark, polished wood dressing table which had a hinged flap screwed onto one side. All was covered in an off-white oilcloth, which had two drawers to the front holding all the cutlery and kitchen utensils. Under the table was a box on roller bearings pulled out for extra seating at meal times. A wooden carver and a folding wooden slatted chair made up the seating arrangements, augmented by a deck chair usually claimed by Albert. The whole floor up to the se seating arrangements um, was covered in painted linoleum with a carpet square on top further reinforced by another rug just before the fender linking the upholstered box ends holding the dried sticks for lighting the morning's fire. Part of Albert's regular duties was to change the washers. The tap washer held in the spigot was tightened into its base by the tap the tap assembly held into the body by a nut the size of which our toolbox could not provide a spanner. An adjustable spanner was the universal tool used in almost all cases where a spanner was required. Unfortunately the adjustable screw mechanism was deficient and its stub screw missing. So you had to hold down the adjusting screw with your first finger and thumb whilst turning the wrench. The U-bend in the kitchen sink became blocked and Albert doing his usual fixing involved minimal preparation and maximum nervous energy.
the rest of the family kept out of the way, pretending that all was normal. The stairs led up to the landing which accessed three bedrooms and a bathroom door, above by, which tra by the trap door was the entry into the loft. The insulation, lagging for the loft pipework and cold storage tank, was sketchy at the best of times, and every year saw the annual freeze-up when the pipes and the inlet valve of the storage tank had to be thawed out. A small paraffin heater was put in the loft to stop the pipes from freezing, but it didn't always do the job. The boys thought this exciting. To Albert it was a calamity. He had to fetch the ladder from outside to reach the trap door in the ceiling. There was no light in the loft. So much for his work was in the dark. It was usually the inlet valve and short section of pipe which led from it. Hot water bottles were passed up through the hatch, candles and paraffin lamp lit, all to assist to thaw out the pipes, and with any luck there would be a hissing noise and the water would start to flow back into the cold water tank. The bathroom at the head of the stairs contained the airing cupboard, the bottom half filled with a galvanised hot water tank. The top half held Tuesday's ironing. The kitchen back boiler was never efficient enough to cope with filling a bath, even when during the war only four inches of water was allowed. A strip wash bin or the order of the day for all. Albert shaved and washed in the kitchen very early in the morning before the children surfaced. Elsie did her ablutions later during the day in peace and quiet, and normally hot water provided by a number of kettles that were carried upstairs. Each of the bedrooms, except for the box room, had a small iron fire grate and surrounds. These were lit on very special occasions, like an illness or birth, before the hearth offender gave boundary to a small hearth rug. Both rooms had carpet squares with an outer border of linoleum. All the rooms in the house were papered. This claim to middle-class convention continued for many years. The wallpaper purchased from the hardware shop needed the lap removed to match up the pattern, achieved with a pair of scissors. Eventually the manufacturer cut this off. Over the years my father tired of papering, decorated the walls by distempering over the paper. A simple solution. Stan and Terry were shepherded off to bed promptly at nine, armed with a sock-wrapped hot water bottle and tucked up in bed with two good-night prayers. The calming influence of the familiar words soon had them off to sleep. Outside, the owls hooted and the cats screamed as the ghostly night trains hurried by, trailing smoke and steam, their whistles fading away into the night sky. The shunting tank engines pushed and shoved their charges into order, declared by the station controller, that the clank and chink of the couplings as each truck collided with the next as they settled down beneath each truck, another batch waiting collection by the freight train that stood by. During the winter months, extra blankets or Albert's greatcoat would be used on the bed. Gradually, all the ex-army blankets had been used up, and then coats were piled on top too. The windows were never opened, thereby causing streams of condensation to drain onto them off of the sill, which eventually soaked the wallpaper beneath. It was fun to watch the competing droplets of water chasing each other as they joined together, forming tributaries, streams, and finally rivers. Then the temperature dropped below freezing, the inside window condensation froze into fantastic patterns, then gradually melted during the day. To once more freeze at night, it was a seasonal hazard. In the mornings there was no dilly-dallying, Night clothes were stripped off, bed socks came off with the trousers and the beds remade, making sure the edges were tucked in properly. Clothes were put on, vests, shirts and jumpers put on all in one go as quickly as possible. 
Hot water bottles collected, and then a quick race down the stairs to the warm kitchen to gather round the fire lit early in the morning by their father. Now it was blazing merrily, the wood crackling and spitting as the sparks flew up the chimney.